Hello, and welcome to this webcast on real-time Ethernet for machine control, sponsored by Omron, and brought to you by Automation World, Design World, and Packaging World. I'm David Greenfield, and I'll be the moderator for this webcast. Now, the use of Ethernet in industrial applications has been growing rapidly over the past five years. So rapidly, in fact, that it almost seems strange now to recall conversations I had with several engineers about the use of Ethernet in manufacturing just prior to 2005. Back then, nearly all of them were very much against the use of Ethernet on the plant floor. They considered it simply an IT network, not an industrial network. Now, that mindset, while it was common just a few years ago, seems almost archaic now as Ethernet has gained wide acceptance in manufacturing. And not just in connecting MES and production scheduling systems with the company's ERP system, but all the way down to the device level. Every week, I see more and more end devices being released with Ethernet ports built into the device. And these devices range from instrumentation for processing facilities to sensors for batch processing and discrete manufacturing applications. But the one issue that still comes up when comparing industrial Ethernet to dedicated industrial networks is determinism. Many engineers are still not entirely sold on Ethernet's capabilities when it comes to keeping up with the data transmission speeds necessary for high-speed motion control on critical production assets. Now, to help answer the questions that remain for so many about the use of real-time Ethernet for machine control, this webcast will provide a comparison of industrial automation networks highlight how actual end-use applications of real-time Ethernet, explain how the EtherCAT industrial Ethernet network can be used to connect multiple steps in the manufacturing process, from design to maintenance, and we'll also look at how Omron is using EtherCAT to integrate numerous different pieces of automation technologies in its facilities. Now, to address these topics, joining me on this webcast are Bill Faber, with Omron Industrial Automation's Motion Drives and Vision Business Unit, Dennis Hydock, who's in charge of Motion, Robot, and Vision Integration at Integrated Industrial Technologies, and Keith Gray with Omron Industrial Automation's Automation Business Unit. Now, before I turn things over to Bill, remember that at the end of this webcast, our panel of experts will be available to answer your questions. Now, at any time during the webcast, feel free to type your questions into the webcast interface and we'll work to get to as many of those questions as possible at the end of the presentations. And so now, I'll turn things over to Bill. Thanks, Dave. Real-time Ethernet for machine control. So what is real-time? And real-time according to what? According to tech terms, it's live or on the fly. According to Wikipedia, it has to do with operational deadlines or guaranteeing response within a specific type guidelines. Uh, it, it's really a relative term unless we put it into context of an application where its target is to accomplish something very specific. If we look at machine control, real time could mean seconds for PID loops to control temperature of an oven, or it could mean milliseconds for the coordination of I.O. with simple indexing or a feed-to-length application, or it can mean microseconds for tight coordination of several axes on a master-slave line shaft application. So how does that fit into the machine control and networks? Well, real-time machine automation is a system-level issue. It requires an architecture view to support the integration of fast components or subsystems. This architecture typically includes sensing, actuation, control, visualization, and interconnection of all these layers. Every control system has some level of interconnection and connection between, compo between components and subsystems. Industrial networks, and more specifically industrial Ethernet networks, enable smart machines for setup, monitoring, maintenance of all these components, which can cost less than hard wiring itself, but it can come at another cost. So what happens when the interconnected devices must both serve information and perform tight synchronization in the same time. Frankly, not much of a problem until the speed of a machine is increased and the lags of the system start to show up as bottlenecks. Components in and of themselves might be fast enough to perform a function, but the bottleneck shows up in the integration of the components. This is where real-time networks come in. 
to allow for system synchronization and determinism for real-time control and production data. What are some of the examples of machine control applications that require real-time? One is this classic uh, rotary or linear flying cutoff. It's simple synchronization between a master and one or more slaves, you can see here. As the speeds of a machine is increased, the movement of large inertia cutter at slave axes, such as this one here, can get erratic uh, with the traditional use of linear or S-curve acceleration profiles. In those cases, many control systems will use electronic camming to create the smoothest and most efficient path in profile. Uh, this itself here requires master slaving. And if there are many axes, Wiring an external encoder master can become costly without a network, so you need a network. Whether the master is an encoder, virtual, or real motor, slaves on a network must know where to cut in precise relation to the master. Uh, and this master, of course, is, is also on the network. Uh, so new master information that comes every scan of the network, and if the, if the network itself is not real-time and deterministic to slave, could receive its command reference at an irregular interval. So you need a real-time network. Similar problems can happen with a four-color uh, color printing line, such as this one here, where the colors must match up precisely to create a clear, clear image. The uh, slave motors that are controlling these color rollers must be aligned with the material that's coming through in real time, and a lack of synchronization could cause slave-to-slave -slave positioning jumps or lags as the updates to the master, the network, and each of the slaves might drift independently. So this problem becomes even more apparent at higher speeds. And there are many other uh, multi-axis coordinated motion control applications that require this kind of real-time network to link axes together. Uh, but as shown in the previous slide, factory production is not just about the precise control of motion. It's more about the control of machines in a line and keeping production going so it includes more. This brings us back up to the architecture level of a machine control, the larger scope behind, beyond just critical motion core. There are two trends that are further pushing real-time Ethernet that seem relevant for this webinar. And one is that Ethernet networks are expanding to the device level, as Dave alluded to earlier. Automation Research Council, they say, Industrial Ethernet, already established at the factory level of industrial automation hierarchies, is now becoming a viable net networking protocol at the I.O. or the field level. And they showed at the time, this quote, some increases in, in uh, uh, prospects. So at the, the device level, where more than just I.O. is, now there are servos, inverters, and vision uh, to achieve synchronous motion control with the other uh, with all the I.O. and the other devices, the networks must be real-time. The second trend is the convergence of control technology platforms. But, uh, in, and uh, we'll quote PMMI, Packaging Machinery Manufacturers Institute, there is a growing need, uh, there is a growing trend towards integrated controllers that perform more than just one function. This eliminates the need to create communications between two controllers simplifying programming and maintenance. But let's face it, uh, control, motion controllers and programmable logic controllers in one, they've been on the market for quite some time already and are already expected by high-end machine builders. In the past few years, we're seeing schematics being integrated into these systems, expanding into higher functionalities to reduce the CPU count. Now we're starting to see vision systems being integrated at a deeper level to allow for simpler setup, quicker maintenance, and faster throughput of the machine control systems. Omron refers to this convergence between motion and vision as MUVI, which covers applications such as move, inspect, reject, move, inspect, orient, and inspection of motion. Basically, this convergence is referring to the overlap between the logic, the motion, and the vision. And it's here that the real time becomes critical at the machine control level and real time networks are needed. So to explain this further, uh, the burdens at the factory floor in systems integration and machine development, they come in many forms. But uh, these pains force many OEMs to drive towards higher levels of efficiencies in machine development, machine deployment, machine production, and machine maintenance. And 
And uh, to explain this further, uh, first, the consumer uh, consumer products uh, changes, for example, uh, they they must get to market faster. So machines need to be developed faster. So secondly, the time that it takes to set up a system on the factory floor, well, that just translates to dollars spent. Thirdly, as production requirements continue to push for higher throughput and yield, and real-time data needs to be served up to other controllers and enterprises, latencies and bottlenecks show up. And finally, troubleshooting can be difficult for changing maintenance personnel trying to maintain a machine with multiple components or simply keeping the machines up and running. So we saw several uh, applications that require some real-time. Uh, converging platforms, they simply require real-time networks to do justice in eliminating the system level latencies and bottlenecks. At the same time, networks allow for smarter machines. And together, this trend of converging platforms and real-time Ethernet expanding to the device level, well, they work together to speed up the machine development, to reduce the integration problems and in machine deployment, eliminate latencies in machine production, and make it easier to maintain the machine. So the system must keep up in performance even when the integration level goes deeper. Performance can't be at the cost of simplicity. So let, let's summarize what, uh, what makes a network real-time or not real-time. And, and here's a couple. Um, if the control and the feedback data of a network node updates slower than the control system, well, it's not real-time because the network just can't keep up. If the update jitter exceeds the node synchronization requirements up to the uh, maximum speed of the machines and the node count, such as 64 axes, it's not real-time because the system needs to be repeatable and deterministic throughout the entire range. If the controller network and slave nodes are operating at different times, it's not real-time. You would need synchronization across the platform. And if the data volume exceeds the network transport kit, the capacity, you have to split it up into multiple frame transmissions, it, it's not real time. It must meet the data throughput requirements of the intended application. And in fact, our controls engineer uh, and our marketing team, team here, Atif Masood, he says, non-real time is a system that cannot, that cannot ensure performing or observing within specific amount of time. So given that, let's take a look at the Ethernet networks in the industrial market today. To be synchronous, deterministic, and practical, we listed a few things here to compare. Now, Ethernet was designed for, lar uh, for large data transfers, but most industrial components, of course, they have small data requirements. So to achieve high-speed determinism, the physical layer is typically modified with special hardware. Now, for example, you can see that most of these networks that have synchronization method, they also require some sort of special hardware chip on a master or slave. That's okay, but it's just what's needed. Circles 3, Profinet IRT, Ethernet IP, SIPSync, all use IEEE 1588 standard to achieve node synchronization with a dither of around one microsecond. And dither is the same as repeatability of a network update. And power link synchronization specifications depend on the frames of the master. EtherCAT uses distributed clocks to synchronize an order of magnitude less than one microsecond. Some networks use hardware to achieve different topology arrangements, as we're shown here, with the most stringent and costly being switches and managed switches. Keep in mind, though, that the addition of, of this network hardware we're talking about here adds delays to the network, which can impact the determinism or throughput. And lastly, and probably the most important in determining the overall performance outcome is the functional principle. Most use polling, which require multiple frames to be assembled with slave, uh, with slave data mapped at the master, then sent to each slave, and then remapped back to the master. EtherCAT takes advantage of the hardware chip on the slave device to perform the on-the-fly processing of each node's input and output data, and additionally, the mapping of the frame is at the slave level as opposed to the master level, which increases data exchange efficiency and offloads some of the work for the master. This makes efficient use of bandwidth. So the biggest thing to look out for in a network is not just speed, but throughput. And for Omron, the criteria for choosing the Ethernet network that is optimized for machine control is it must be fast and efficient. 
it must be open and accepted, and it must be deterministic and, and repeatable. Why? Because Omron Industrial Automation has a goal to help OEMs achieve complete machine automation. Here's an example uh, that takes a comparative test that shows cycle time outcome for 40 axes and about 2200 I.O. EtherCAT is the fastest and most efficient with a cycle time of 276 microseconds, the next closest being Circos 3. It's an open network that is globally accepted with over, over 1,600 members and, and, and many slave devices on ethercat.org web, website. And it's deterministic down to below one microsecond repeatability or jitter. Now, EtherCAT uses distributed clocks to ensure it's truly deterministic and repeatable. The specification claims much less than one microsecond because it not only does it measure the propagation delay for each slave and compensate for that, but it also learns the topology of the network and it factors that in as well. Networks that have switches or managed switches will, neg will negatively impact this jitter. And this is one of the reasons why EtherCAT has such low jitter performance. It learns the network and it uses that information to determine the delay that needs to be set at each slave. We believe that the best control systems will provide you with the measurement of the system performance and in, and in this case, we're showing you a screen dump of a network diagnostics uh, and statistics information. You can see that the jitter for this system is 80 nanoseconds uh, for a system of about two axes and, and an I.O. block on EtherCAT. So if you ever wonder why two motors on a line shaft application might not want be lined up as expected at any speed, well, jitter is why. Distributed clocks make sure all axes receive their commands at the same time and the accuracy of the transmission from one cycle to the next, make sure that it's repeatable from one command to the next. 80 nanoseconds is just fast. The best real-time networks achieve machine control by putting all real-time devices on the same network. One real-time network enables faster, simpler, and smarter machines. So setup is easier on one network. Synchronization is automatic on one real-time network. And centralized error reporting is realized on one real-time network. You will see more and more controls companies that are, con that are converging these technologies, putting devices that require real-time control onto one network. And here's an example of a controller that has it built in. Two popular Ethernet-based network protocols with one common physical layer. Easy to wire, easy to find CAT5 cables and RJ45 connectors. This system allows to to use the, the, the protocol for what it was designed for. Ethernet IP, in its design, is very good at moving lots of information from controller to controller, passing data to HMIs or enterprise. EtherCAT, in its design, is very good at moving small amounts of data deterministically and fast from master to slave or slave to slave in real time. So this implementation shows two protocols for one purpose, the purpose of machine automation. So next, uh, we'll show two applications that emphasize the scope of complete machine automation. One is, the, one is uh, where it shows the performance measured in cycle time and the other performance measured in practical usage. The good news is that you can have both without sacrificing the other. So Dennis, uh, we'll be uh, introducing Dennis here. He'll be showing the uh, dial table vision inspection system. Dennis, uh, why don't you tell us who you are? Uh, give us a little background on what types of customers you work with and, and what are your years of experience in systems integration? Okay. Well, thank you, Bill. Um, I'm with uh, I2T. We're a uh, Pittsburgh-based systems integrator, and we're provide, we provide specialized high-end complex motion applications with robots and vision and PLCs uh, using various automation manufacturers. Uh, and we've been doing this uh, for over uh, 20 years now. And uh, we are also an Omron solution provider. We're authorized to implement the, the Omron uh, uh, com uh, automation components in different types of uh, assembly machines, packaging lines, machine tool applications, and web processes. And uh, some of the industries that we serve in is uh, automotive, tire and rubber, glass, machine tool manufacturing, um, metals, and chemical and packaging. But uh, this application today is going to be dealing with vision and how it ties in with the EtherCAT network. And a lot of the vision applications that we've done in the past were 
uh, dealt directly with detecting random parts on a pallet, for instance, for a robot to pick up, basically, just to give a uh, offset to the robot and it knows where to uh, pick it up and then place it into different parts of uh, different machinery. Uh, others have been just detecting missing labels and rejecting them in uh, different packaging type of applications. Let's see here. Get control here. Okay, well the challenge that we had is um, basically we had to have a high speed, uh, uh, we were asked by a machine builder to conduct a proof of concept uh, to do a study, uh, to do a 100% uh, percent inspection of various size, bol uh, size bolts for a tier 2 automotive application. And um, the objective here, let's see, was to achieve about 500 inspections per minute, okay. And um, basically, we needed to inspect the head, the sides, the threads for 100% of the bolts, and uh, and and basically uh, that would translate into about 120 millisecond uh, cycle time. Uh, besides the uh, two servos that were used to position the dial index table and the bolt rotation for the threads, 14 other servo axes were needed, and approximately 150 um, I/O points. Uh, we're going to be part of this machine. And the uh, control system will have to update all these components and uh, uh, fast enough to keep up with the 120 millisecond cycle time. Okay, basically, whoops, got to go backwards here one. Uh, the proposed design for the machine uh, would have bolts basically fed down via a bolt feeder and aligned such that their shafts were located in a down position of a linear feed conveyor. And then this linear feed conveyor would position the bolts into radial slots on the dial index table, which uh, would rotate the bolts through two inspection stations. In the first inspection station, the bolt will be inspected by two cameras, one above and uh, one on a side, and basically the one on top was going to inspect for the head diameter size and any imperfections. Well, the side one was looking to uh, look at um, you know the the pitch of the bolts, uh, the shank length, overall length, and major and um, minor thread diameters besides the pitch. And then um, when the dial index table rotated to the next uh, inspection station, uh, the bolt was going to be spun spun by another servo motor and another camera is basically going to look at it uh, over one revolution of its uh, rotation to check for damaged threads. So in each of the following dial stations after that, um, the bolts then were tracked to see if they would be, uh, if they were a good bolt or a bad bolt and they would basically basically be ejected by a high pressure air nozzle to uh, into a reject bin or into a, a good bin. And basically, the bad bolts would go back to the supplier, and the good bolts would go on to the um, to the um, application. The old process basically used analog cameras that needed uh, frame grabber boards and a PC to digitize the image of the part. Uh, image analysis software was also needed by the PC, basically to determine if the inspected parts were good or bad. And uh, digital I.O. from this PC then was used to communicate the good-bad status of the part uh, to a PLC for controlling the rest of the process. The PLC then used the digital I.O. to communicate to a stepper controller for indexing the table and rotating the part. And then stepper amplifiers converted the pulsed motion signals from the indexer boards to current for the stepper motor windings to position axes. This basically was a complex solution to a simple problem. And in this system, there was a large number of analog components that were very susceptible to electrical noise in the industrial environment. And also, to the initial system needed a good deal of labor and engineering for assembling, wiring, and programming all the dissimilar components from all the different manufacturers. So this system was also hard to troubleshoot because of the number of components and dissimilar uh, protocols. And besides that, it was fairly slow. For the proof of concept engineering study, um, we used a uh, Omeron uh, Trajectia TJ264. Basically, it was uh, controlling up to 16 axes of motion for this application, and it had Ethernet connectivity. And um, 
also too a Omron FZM1 high-speed camera and controller were used to connect the EtherCAT network and its image data was easily uh, transmitted to the trajectory motion controller. Also too we used two Omron G5 EtherCAT servo amplifiers and motors and they were used to simulate the dial index table and the bolt rotation axes. And then all the position and synchronization and status information was sent uh, to the axes via the EtherCAT network. Uh, Fourteen other axes would be simulated uh, to basically try to simulate the actual um, machine. There's also an Armron NS 10-inch uh, programmable terminal which was connected to the trajectory via Ethernet and this simulated the machine status, setup parameters, faults, etc. And then uh, Armron Smart Slice I.O. and GX series block I.O. then were used to simulate the um, the actual um, I.O. in this system. And to tie everything together, we used the Armron CX-1 programming environment, which basically allowed us to program the motion, the vision, the um, uh, HMI panels, and tied basically everything together very nicely. No other programs were necessary. Well, some of the advantage uh, for using the Armour and EtherCAT solution were a reduction or elimination of noise issues because uh, digital networks are inherently immune to noise. The system became easier to maintain and troubleshoot since all the components are connected via one network and all control status and fault information was readily available across this network. Then all the wiring, too, was reduced by using CAT5 Ethernet hardware and cables. And uh, the f when the final system is uh, finally designed, we can actually move the um, G5 servos basically next to the motors and just run an EtherCAT cable to those um, locations because you can run the uh, EtherCAT up to 100 meters away from the main controller. And also, too, uh, using the single supplier allows for easier connectivity between the components. There was no need to have different networks or protocol converters. And then standard Ethernet hardware, as I mentioned before, RJ45s, CAT5 cables, and then also, too, you can use the industrial Ethernet connectors, connectors and shield cables uh, in high noise areas. And uh, by using a single network, single supplier, and standard hardware, product changeover and process modifications would be easier to do, too. This all translated into a reduction in design, engineering, programming, and commissioning of the entire project, and thereby saving uh, a lot in capital expenditures. This slide basically shows a typical setup screen of um, the FCM1 uh, camera, and it says all, all basically all the camera parameters were easily adjusted using the uh, integrated setup menus for uh, for the slave configuration. Also, the communication settings were set from here. All the camera adjustments, output data format, and uh, it also did automatic image calibration. On this screen, um, it shows it was pretty easy to um, to connect the trajectory to the uh, camera system, basically. Um, once the Cat5 cable was connected and the camera controller uh, basically configured um, to the trajectory's EtherCAT master module, no switches or hubs were necessary. And after setting up the camera, uh, and all it took was just one line of motion basic code to basically set this up and started uh, transmitting data registers back and forth between the uh, EtherCAT camera and the motion controller. Um, so for example, the uh, command highlighted on there shows you basically just one line of code was all that was necessary to get this transmission started. And this data can also to represent if you're using a robot for instance um, it can represent X Y and theta offsets for picking up parts so basically within one scan uh, it was fairly quick to um, to get this data back into the motion controller this slide here basically uh, shows that um, basically that uh, it simulated the lab um, results that we got back when we were uh, networking the camera to the motion controller. And um, this table shows the times measured by the camera controller and the trajectory right after a trigger was sent uh, to start the capture of the image. The left column basically is the operation being performed. The middle column are the times for the Omron 
EtherCAT system. In the right column are the times for a system that used the Ethernet network camera to a trajectory of motion controller, and basically just kind of simulating the uh, throughput of the system. And so does the real time really matter? Um, yes, it does. Um, in this simulation, the EtherCAT network solution is about 30% faster uh, for each cycle. Using this data, we can achieve a cycle time of approximately 568 cycles per minute. Now, once all the other components and mechanical parts are added to the process, the actual cycle time will only be limited by, limited by the slowest component in the system. However, this shows that uh, the EtherCAT network will not be the limiting factor. The EtherCAT network in configuration was simple and fast to implement. It took only an hour to configure the camera, set up its parameters, and set the, uh, the network up, and configure the motion controller, and write the code to get the data to the motion controller. So real time is needed for the motion control process uh, because if another network is used, you basically have the overhead of a different protocol and the speed and limitation of that physical network itself to contend with. So basically, the bottleneck is a system issue limited by scan time process execution, but the network is not the bottleneck at all. And basically, in summary, uh, the Omron EtherCAT solution was easy to implement from a connection standpoint. Plugging in a cable basically saves a lot more time than connecting to individual wires. Uh, existing connection hardware and cables are readily available and inexpensive. Uh, setup was easy uh, via simple menus and command implementations. No complex code had to be written. And as shown on previous slides, synchronization is very fast. Less time spent commissioning translates into project savings, and high noise immunity translates into less downtime. So all this translates into an overall project and operational cost and savings for the entire process. That's a, now, uh, a great. I'm going to turn this over to uh, Keith Gray. Uh, he's the strategic account manager for automotive for Omron Automation. Before we uh, move on. Uh, Dennis, I got a question for you. This sounds like a really great application. Dennis, how long did it take for you to put together the previous system? It took the better part of a week or two, a week and a half, basically, once we got through all the manuals and uh, read all the different protocols and the commands that needed to be set up. It, it basically took a great bit of time to do that, but everything uh, was outlined fairly good in the uh, Omron uh, setup process so that it was easy to set up, plus the camera was, once you got through the pr um, setup screens on the camera, the actual implementation of the EtherCAT from the motion controller to the camera was fairly fast. Uh, like I said, just that one line of code instantly got me data into the registers that I needed uh, for um, you know, basically making my decisions as far as the logic is concerned. So you went from one and a half, one and a half weeks to to what? So basically, a, an afternoon in a day, in one day. You went from one and a half weeks to a day. Wow, that's uh, that's a lot of time savings. Is this, is this in your in your with your from your experience? Is this common? No, basically, I would like to see most applications be this way, uh, because. Uh, we like to save a lot in engineering, basically. The time that we spend out is mostly in the field putting systems together, where um, when you can save a lot in-house by doing all the configuration and everything ahead of time, it's going to save a lot of time in the field also. So this saved us a lot of time in-house where we would might have overspent on the project. Yeah, I'll say. So uh, now... Uh, we would like to move on to the next application dealing with preventative maintenance in the automotive industry. And we're going to introduce uh, Keith Gray, uh, Keith, who is a strategic account manager in the Omron. Uh, Keith, how long have you been in the automotive industry? Uh, 16 years now, Bill. It's a long time. Good. So you, yeah. you can speak from experience, I'd say. <laughs> yeah, I can. I, I've done a lot of... Uh, a lot of applications and things in the automotive uh, uh, arena, you know, over the last 16 years. And, and one of the, the big, uh, you know, common things among all of these applications that, I, that I've that i done is that, you know, automotives really want to do whatever they can to prevent downtime. Um, and that's part of uh, the application that I'm presenting today. 
I uh, was at a major automotive manufacturing uh, company one day, and I had found out that they uh, were going to be changing out some of their old obsolete and servo systems. And I found out that the, the new system that they were looking at, it was, it was the same company, but this new system, they would essentially have to really change out a lot of stuff. So it, it was almost like putting in a whole brand new system. Um, so I thought, well, heck, we, uh, you know, we have this new EtherCat uh, servo system. This, this would be great. Well, you know, this is my opportunity. I'm going to go in there and, uh, you know, wow them and uh, get the sale. So I, uh, you know, went up to them and said, hey, look, here we got this new EtherCat system. You know, would you guys uh, consider looking at us, uh, you know, in, in, instead of uh, sticking with what you got? And they said, well, no, nah, not really. Uh, you know, we, we've already made the decision. We're going to, you know, just move up to the, the, uh, the newer series in this, and that's it. Um, you know, and I said, well, what if I could show you something that this does better than yours? And I said, okay, well, great. Let's, uh, let, let's see it. So at the time, I, I really I couldn't quite think of what that was. So I, so I asked him, well, let, let, let me ask you a couple questions. What, what is your biggest issue uh, with servos right now? <clears throat> and they, they had given me uh, this information I, I just found outstanding. I, I've never quite heard of this, that when they have a servo issue, that it takes them an average of 45 minutes to fix it. I, I, I just I couldn't believe that. I still can't even believe it now. Because in automotive, just having a couple minutes of downtime is extremely expensive. You, you can imagine you have you know hundreds of people standing around doing nothing. You know, basically collecting money. You're not producing parts. It, it's really expensive. So, you know, 45 minutes is, is really unbelievable. So he said, well, you know, how can you help us fix that with your EtherCAT system? And you know, I had to think about it. it, it you know, I, I didn't know the answer right offhand. But then, you know, as I got to thinking, I'm like, well, you know. With EtherCAT, we can give real-time data, and, and part of that data that we can give is speed torque information. So I asked them, well, what if you know we can prevent some of these downtime issues by giving you real-time speed torque data to be able to give you all of this information that you can see ahead of time before something happens? And I said, well, that 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 would be great. That sounds pretty good. So what I did is we put a put a system together that includes our CJ2 PLT, um, an NS touchscreen, and our servo motors and drives uh, to, to solve this. And the system, that, what's nice about it with the EtherCAT, you can um, you know, add a lot of different things. You can put drives, you can put vision, you can put I.O. with it. It's got you know, Ethernet or Ethernet IP. So you know, I, I thought of the pretty robust system. And, and what we did with this is we put all the speed work data up on the HMI so that they could see what is going on with their system. So we programmed it such that they could hook it up to a machine, they can run their motion, and this thing would teach the motion profile. And then what we did is, uh, you can probably see on the screen maybe a little bit, we have uh, a plus and minus tolerance range on here that you can set. You can put plus and minus 5, plus and minus 20 percent, so that if that speed torque curve goes up out of that range, you can get an alarm. It will tell you where exactly in the motion profile um, that this uh, problem has occurred. So I said, well, you know, is, is that really going to help you guys out? You know, that way, you know, instead of waiting for a catastrophic event to happen and and you have all this downtime with this, you can kind of see the trend over time, maybe check it once a week. And then with this system, maybe you put up, you know, maybe 10%. And then when something happens, you know, with your mechanicals or whatever, they start to wear out, you know, you can have this alarm hit, maybe not necessarily shut down the line, but just say, hey, there, there, there's an issue here. Then that way, you can wait till third shift, you can wait till the weekend and fix it then before it becomes a, a really critical problem. So we started off with that and we're like, oh, well, that's great, but, but there's a lot of other issues with, uh, with servo motors that we have. And, and one of them is, you know, a lot of times we'll put these things in and, uh, you know, maybe, maybe something doesn't happen for a year, a year and a half. And, and after that, everybody kind of forgot about this system. They don't remember anything with it. You know, how, how can you help us with that when we get some kind of error or something that comes up? So I had to think about that a little bit. I'm like, well, you know, we got this great system. What we can do is we can take all of those error codes and put them into the HMI so that 
um, when anything happens, you know, an error code will pop up. Let's say if a, uh, you know, a battery goes out in your absolute encoder or something, you know, it'll pop up with a message say, hey, absolute, uh, you know, encoder battery is uh, getting low, you need to replace it. Then you hit a little button and we have a pop up that tells you exactly how to replace that step by step instructions with pictures. And what we did is we programmed all of the error code in like that. So a message will pop up, tell you what the error code is and how to fix it. Now we're talking. You know, that was really huge for them because, you know, like I say, you know, after a year, you don't know what's going on. And the problem is with a lot of these servo problems, you need um, someone who is really experienced and trained on how to fix it. Um, you know, and that takes time. Once this thing goes down, you got to go find someone. They come in, they look at it. You know, you got to get a pull out your laptop, and you know, all that stuff takes time. Whereas this system, everything is right there. You know, it tells you everything that you need to know to fix the problem. Um, one of the other things that, that they had brought up with this that was interesting, they said, well, that's all great and good. So you give us speed tour curves. You're giving us, you know, error codes. Um, you know, what if we have to change out a motor or drive. <laughs> so I started laughing, but I'm like, all right, well, I, I think we can work with that. So we went back to the drawing board, and um, working with the engineers, we came up with a, uh, you know, basically the same thing with our error code, a step-by-step -step, um, instruction uh, sheet on how to change out a motor and a drive. So, and, and that's what this next slide, this is just one of, of several slides that show, you know, you can uh, go in there if you see the drive and say, hey, you know, unplug the power, unplug the motor power cable, take the Ethernet, you know, cable out, and, and, and you know, a subsequent, you know, uh, slide will show you how to put all that stuff back together. So what we did is when we developed this, you know, I wanted to make sure that, that all of this was easy to understand. So I was sitting there one day after we finally got it all done, and I'm like, all right, well, we, we need to really test this out on somebody who, who hasn't ever seen it. So my, my intention was to go up and grab my wife and have her come down and uh, you know try this out to, to see if it made sense to her. Uh, but then in comes my uh, my ten year old son, and a, a light bulb went off. I'm like, man, you know, if I can get my ten year old son to be able to change out a servo motor and a drive, I, I think you know anybody can do it. So you know, I called them over and said, "Hey, can you, can you help me out with this?" And you know, the a typical ten-year-old, you know, is like, "Dad, come on! I, I got better things to do. I could be playing games. I could be hanging out with my buddies. I, I don't want to really be helping you with work." <laughs> but uh, but I finally convinced them to to help me out, and it would only take a few minutes. So he actually sat there. He, he's never seen a servo motor or a drive in his life. He couldn't even tell you what it is. Um, and I had him walk through all of these screens and these steps, and he was able by himself without any prompting because I, I just I stood back I didn't want to help him one bit and he was able to change out that motor and drive and get it all back online and working um, so it, it was a pretty amazing thing to see so at that point yeah I, I was extremely happy so I went in and showed it to the customer and uh, it worked out great so the, the nice thing with this again you don't need a laptop to do all this. You know, all the instructions are there. I mean, even down to uh, when you put in a, a motor, you know, you have to re-zero it out. Um, all of that is built in to this system. So what we do is um, for the drive, we have all of the parameters, everything uh, loaded up that you can see on this system real time. And what we do is we save all that information into the PLC. So if you ever have to change out that drive, you put the new drive in, and there's you know one of the steps in there is hey download all the the parameters from the old drive to the new drive, and you're you're up and running within minutes. I mean my son was able to to change out the motor and drive in in about five minutes, and and he had no clue um, what he was really doing. Um, so this system is, is really working out very, very good. Um, th this particular customer is, is uh, looking at starting to put these in um, in the December uh, time frame. So I thought, man, you know, this is really great. So I, I should probably start showing this to some other automotive companies. I mean, I, you know, you'd have to imagine that they would want to see this thing. So I took it to another pretty major um, automotive manufacturer. This is the first time that they've ever seen it. They had a, uh, a new line 
that they were working on, and you know they need obviously PLCs and touch screens and the whole thing. And I said, look, you, you, sh you should take a look at this system and see what you think. And we went in and showed them, and they were just absolutely astounded. Um, they're going to use this whole system on their new line next year when they get it in. You know, it, it was that powerful of a demo. I mean, uh, it seems like most of the engineers and maintenance guys just love this thing, just just because of the ease of use. Um, I even went into another customer, not really intending to, to talk to them about this demo, but as I got in there, we started talking about servos, and they started talking about what they wanted to do. And, and you know, in my mind, I'm just sitting there smiling because they're telling me all of the stuff that we already did um, with the system that they want to do. And I said, well, okay, hang on for a second. And I, I walked out to my car. I just happened to have it in my car, and I grabbed it. I, I pulled it in. and and showed it to them, and they were like, man, this is exactly what we want. And uh, they said, how about this? How about we go hook this up on our machine now and test it out? <laughs> and, you know, I just started laughing. I was like, really? You want to, like, go put this on your machine now? And they said, well, yeah, you have that function in there where, where you can teach the motion profile, right? Can we, can we do that with our system? And, and I said, well, yeah, we can. You know, typically I, I don't like to do that, uh, but sure, let's go do it. And uh, so we took it out from the machine. It took us a while to, you know, mechanically set everything up and get things ready. But once we did, in in a few minutes, we had them up and running with this system. We talked the motion profile. We put the, the plus or minus range in there, and it was off and running. And, you know, they, they messed around with the mechanics a little bit to try to, to get it to trip, and we were able to make it trip like it was supposed to, and uh, it worked out great. You know, they um, even sent their machine to one of our distributors, uh, you know, pretty much that, you know, next day to go ahead and get this system really integrated into their machine. So it, it, it's a very powerful, you know, system that we did. It's very customizable, so there's a lot of things that, uh, that you can do with it. Here. All right, looks like my screens went out there for a second. But uh, basically, in summary, you know, it, it's a it's a nice system. It's a real time network. Um, you know, the the beautiful thing of it is you have a centralized HMI that can give you all of the error error messages. Um, you have all your real time and uh, updates of speed torque. And by real time, you know, this system. Uh, it, it is updating the, the speed torque um, every scan of the PLC. So it's essentially real time. You're talking, you know, millisecond or so, uh, you know, to update that to the PLC, and then, you know, it takes maybe another couple milliseconds to display um, on the, the uh, screen. So it's, it's extremely fast. Um, so that is it for my presentation. Um, one thing that is uh, not on this slide is um, if you guys are excited enough and you, and you want the system, um, you know, you, you're more than uh, welcome to send all your POs to uh, keep.braidomon.com and, and we'll help you out. <laughs> all right, well, I'll hand it uh, off to uh, uh, Bill Faber now. Thanks, Keith. Uh, you seem really excited, and now I see. Now I understand why. And uh, it just you, you don't you don't need a laptop to replace a servo on EtherCAT. Is that is that what you're saying? Yeah, it, it, it's all built in um, on the screen, step by step of exactly how to do it. Sounds like you made uh, changing out a servo as simple as uh, changing out a, a printer cartridge. <laughs> yeah, pr pretty much is. Yeah, like I said, I mean, if, if a ten year old can do it, like I said, I mean, anybody can. So as long as Dennis is on the phone, uh, Dennis, if a, if a plant wanted to validate this uh, template, you know, with their own process and install it, does this some, look like something that you'd you could take further to integrate uh, and perform factory acceptance testing services? Or yeah, basically we would take the code and the uh, the hardware and kind of integrate it into the project that we would be doing for someone. And this would save me later down the road a lot of time and money, basically at two o'clock in the morning whenever they want to switch something out because um, nobody really wants to do it at that time in the morning. So I'm, I'd be glad to have something like this, um, you know, to integrate into projects. Okay, great. Well, some of the uh, key the summary uh, and key takeaways is that we're we're seeing a lot of machine builders and OEMs are facing constant demands for more efficient machine design, deployment, uh, throughput, and, and simpler maintenance. 
Uh, we're seeing real-time networks are, are really required to achieve true, complete machine automation from uh, doing high speed to just monitoring uh, without even sacrificing performance. Converging technology platforms are putting higher demands on real-time networks and control systems and, and putting all the real-time devices on one networking protocol, it, it ensures performance and simplicity. And, and, and so if there's anything we, uh, we'd like you to take away, and that's that, uh, the, if you're, some of the things we'd ask you to do uh, as a result of this presentation is, is uh, learn for yourself about real-time Ethernet. Uh, go to ethercat.org. Um, you can even come to the Ethercat Technology Roadshow. There's six locations. Uh, all the uh, attendees and, uh, that came to this will receive a, an exclusive invitation from Omron. Um, and also, t take, a, take a moment to step back and evaluate machine control platform for bottlenecks. You know, is it in the interconnection? Is it in the network? Okay. Well, thank you, Bill. Uh, and thank you, Keith and Dennis, for uh, your presentations. We'll uh, go ahead and get to uh, questions from the audience. We've got a number of them here to get to. And uh, I guess one of them that's a good overall one to start, and I think this one will be uh, most appropriate for you, Bill. Uh, the question is, is EtherCAT a universal protocol that's available or applicable to all automation level equipment, or is it a proprietary network? Well, EtherCAT is an open network, uh, ethercat.org. You can go there to, to get more information on it. Um, it's an open network, and that's one of the reasons why Omron selected it. We, we prefer to, to go with the open networks that are out there. And it uh, uh, has the ability, to, as we've shown here, uh, to do real-time control. And then you can also embed in that uh, other uh, frames in, in non-real-time data to pass information back and forth. And, and, and for instance, uh, the presentation that Keith gave is that you can you can pull out and reinstall uh, a servo drive, and uh, in order to do that, obviously you have to upload and download parameters. Otherwise, you need a PC or something to set it up. Uh, so this allows you to pull data down from from the master and, and from the uh, uh, from a HMI. You can say download all the parameters. The controller downloads them all. Uh, so you've got real-time data and non-real-time data on the same network. Hope that answers the question. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Bill. And uh, this one's for Keith. It's in relation to your presentation there towards uh, the end of the presentations. Uh, in the torque graph data that you displayed uh, about being updated in real time, can you give some information about what rate uh, the data was being displayed at? Yeah, the, the, the data is actually being updated uh, faster than it can be displayed. It's about a, you know, a one millisecond because it's updated uh, every scan time um, into the HMI, you know, two to four milliseconds. So it, it's, it's extremely fast. Okay. Now this one, we've got a question here from one of the audience members to uh, Dennis uh, in looking at uh, the the system uh, that you were explaining there, and they were asking if you utilize a system simulation tool before building a complex eth uh, Ethernet-enabled system, such as the Bolt Inspection System. Yeah, basically, we try to do a lot of simulation ahead of time before actually implementing it, and um, the um, Trajectia software and the other PLC softwares have some simu uh, simulation uh, capabilities to them where you can actually have virtual axes turning and trying to do all the motion ahead of time without actually doing any sensing or anything. You could do external triggering or you can do triggering from within the programs themselves to actually uh, simulate an automation process. So yes, we do do a lot of that uh, ahead of time to try to uh, minimize the amount of uh, uh, setup and uh, trial that we have at either the machine manufacturer or else, else the end user. Okay. And Dennis, while I, while I have you on the line, I have a, another question here for you. Um, you know, as a system integrator, you know, working out in the field with a variety of different clients, you know, how many EtherCAT products are you seeing out there on a regular basis? We're, we're actually starting to see more and more. Um, of course, Backoff was the originator of EtherCAT, but then uh, the ethercat.org organization was spun off of that. But, uh, for instance, there's about over 60 manufacturer, uh, 
manufacturers of servos alone that are on the EtherCAT organization that are uh, compatible with the EtherCAT protocol. So we're we're starting to see a lot more uh, just popping up uh, in the um, in the industrial uh, automation side. Okay. Yeah, I think that 60 is uh, it's it's, uh, it's 60 just servo drive manufacturers alone. Right, just there's there's hundreds of other. Um, there's hundreds uh, of additional. Correct. There's hundreds of additional um, people out there that uh, support the EtherCAD or, or use EtherCAD on their uh, automation products. Just to piggyback on that, there's, uh, there's over 1,600, uh, as I mentioned in the presentation, over 1,600 members of the EtherCAT.org website that are, that are actually making slave devices of some sort. Okay. All right. Thank you, Bill and Dennis. And uh, this one's an interesting one. This one's actually referencing uh, the physical layer of um, uh, Ethernet, and it's referring to the RJ45 uh, connector. It's the familiar little end clip that we're all familiar with plugging in uh, Ethernet into any system, be it our computer or an end device. And this is uh, from a, a viewer of the webcast who's wondering if there are any other form factors, because in some of the systems design that they're working in to, to Ethernet enable, uh, it might be more helpful to have smaller uh, form factors to work with. Are you familiar with any that are standard and not customized that are being used uh, with Ethernet or with EtherCAT in particular that you can speak to? I'm assuming this might be one for Bill or maybe uh, Dennis in the end use area. Yeah, uh, this is Dennis. Basically, um, there are industrialized EtherCAT connections or Ethernet type connections. Uh, there's the, um, I'm not sure of the actual size, but a uh, DIN type connector that's you know, either like an M8 or an M12 type connector that is used to connect uh, hardened devices. And it's also um, immune to the environment also being uh, probably like an IP65, uh, 67 type of uh, uh, rating on those. And it also is uh, compatible with the industrial cable for Ethernet too. So there are standards out there for a more industrialized uh, cable other than the RJ45 and the CAT5 type systems that you see in the office. Okay. Thank you, Dennis. Um, now, uh, here's a question for Bill. Uh, it's uh, referencing uh, in one of your slides earlier in the webcast, uh, you noted that EtherCAT is, EtherCAT is the fastest of the Ethernet networks uh, out there available. And they're asking if this level of speed, you know, how much does it matter for all types of uh, automation applications? Uh, we get that question a lot. Uh, you know, Omron really selected this network because of its overall performance and, of course, because it's becoming more and more globally accepted as a, as a real-time field bus network on Ethernet. What impressed us most was, was not just how fast it was, but how efficiently it handled the, the data on the master-slave. Um, this, this really made it scalable. So really what's two for two axes is true for 16 or, or true for 17 or even, even 64 axes of coordinated motion control. Um, you know, OEMs that are building machines at the high end or at the low end, they want scalable, they want scalable uh, platforms. So e even though it might not uh, need it for some of those low end applications, they have a common interface then for the high end and they can just port it right over. Uh, also, you know, we needed a, a network that was not going to be the, the bottleneck simply. So we choose one of the highest, uh, uh, one with the highest throughput. Um, we're integrating motion, logic, and vision, and these three technology platforms oftentimes put a tax on the controller and, and on most control systems that are out there. So EtherCAT really enables the convergence without sacrificing the performance. You know, it's, it's the simplicity of, of complete automation uh, with, with minimizing the, uh, the bottleneck at the, at the network side. So we, we kind of look at it from the complete automation perspective. Okay. Thank you. Um, this question uh, comes from a viewer who is involved in automation integration for an enterprise resource planning software company, uh, specifically uh, in relation to uh, collecting process control data for storage in the database for analysis. And he or she is wondering if EtherCAT is suitable for this type of use, um, and if so, is there documentation available for that? And I would assume this would be a question for Bill. Yeah, I, what, what we do in that 
the scenario is, uh, I think one of the slides we showed two networks going into the controller, and, and really in that scenario we use the networking protocol for what it's designed for. For instance, Ethernet IP is, is really good at moving large amounts of data, but may not necessarily be as deterministic as, as uh, EtherCAT. So we've got EtherCAT built in. You'll probably see it uh, in more controllers like we were talking about before, you know, with the common Ethernet uh, interface, but uh, with multiple protocols to handle the specific needs. And, and really, we've identified that there's the information side and the real-time side. And what we're, we're seeing, too, is that as you're pulling, you're able to pull some data that's necessary on the real-time side, enough to do maintenance, do the real-time control, uh, and then port that information up to the controller so that it has a separate network. And in fact, even systems that are out there that boast, uh, you know, using the same networking protocol, they'll probably have two separate uh, uh, physical ports that you plug into so that the networks themselves are segregated. Does anybody else want to comment on that? No, I kind of agree. Like you said, basically use the uh, the protocol that does what it's known for best, and like you said, the uh, Ethernet for um, basically transmitting a, a great amount of data and uh, tying together machines for your MRP system or your um, management reporting type systems on production data is best suited for Ethernet, not EtherCAT, which is more deterministic because you don't want anything else bogging down a system or the network itself where Ethernet allows for that. Yeah, and in some systems, you know, you need a real-time network to collect the data and then you use the controller to kind of concentrate it and then you can pass the, that, that kind of data then up to the enterprise systems. Most enterprise systems don't need that level of determinism, the level of determinism that's required for some of the high-performance applications. Thank you, Bill and Dennis. And I think we've got time for one last question here, and uh, this one is uh, for Keith. And it's based with all that's going on in the automotive industry, the way they've really bounced back here the past couple of years, uh, and your experience in working in that industry. Uh, are you seeing any plans uh, in the automotive industry to implement more EtherCAT components in uh, upcoming future product projects? Yeah, uh, I've actually had uh, several talks with auto manufacturers where we've uh, gathered uh, many people, and in some of these meetings, you may be up to 50 people, including uh, engineering, maintenance, IT, uh, you know, a bunch of different individuals uh, talking about just, you know, that very thing. So, yeah, they, they are looking at using um, EtherCAT more for the device level. Uh, you know, I.O., servos, um, you know, that type of thing, whereas they would still use uh, Ethernet IP uh, on, on, on uh, connecting to the databases and, and upper-level computers and things like that. So, yeah, that, that those talks are going on at, at a lot of different uh, automotive manufacturers. Okay. Well, thank you, Keith, and thank you, Bill and Dennis, uh, all of you, for sharing your insight and information today. And I'd like to thank all of you who joined us for this webcast. We hope you found the information provided helpful uh, to your questions regarding real-time Ethernet for machine control.